There's a strong stereotype in our culture that's exemplified by caricatures and animation, cartoons, and even comedic sketches. And this stereotype says that if you're strong, you're coordinated, you're capable, that you're probably stupid. And the opposite, that if you're smart, that you're probably uncoordinated, weak, and ungainly. Well, as my contribution to blur this line and break this stereotype, I want to do a series on scholar warriors and interview various people that are both smart and warriors and strong. Today, my first guest is Dr. Peter Lorsch. He's a professor at Vanderbilt University and the author of a book that I found amazing and highly educational after years of trying to search for something like this and not being able to find it. I found it about a year, year and a half ago. Chinese martial arts from antiquity to the 21st century. It spans the gamut from the beginning of Chinese civilization, the very first dynasty, all the way to modern day and how Chinese martial arts played a role in that. I think you will enjoy our conversation. And Dr. Lorge definitely is not weak. The man has been doing martial arts since he was a teenager. And now, every week he goes to war on the mats a few times a week doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and putting himself through the grind and the crucible. So I think you'll enjoy our conversation. We're going to talk a lot about Chinese martial arts history, some major pivotal figures in Chinese martial arts, and we'll probably riff on Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and the UFC for a bit too. So I'll break this up into multiple parts. Let's get started. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm joined by Dr. Peter Lorge. He's a professor at Vanderbilt University, and he's a lifelong martial artist. He's been, I believe, since your teens, right? Yeah. Is that accurate? Yep. Uh, kickboxing, Chinese wrestling, yep. Chinese boxing, yeah, a really little bit, right. and lately Brazilian jiu-jitsu for the past decade. Is that yep. okay? And uh, he's joined me today. He's the author of a book, Chinese Martial Arts from Antiquities to the 21st Century, which I invited him uh, to join us on this podcast to discuss some things out of his book and pick his brain because he's got a lot of stuff in there that uh, I'm cu very curious about. So, <laughs> And something you, no one should hear about. <laughs> so uh, welcome and thanks for joining us today. I read your book. I found it in 2018. I actually had given up on pursuing any history for Chinese martial arts because I had drained the well dry back in uh, 2011, maybe. And then I guess I stopped looking right when you came out with your book. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised when I found it because one thing that I having, I have a very eclectic background in Chinese boxing. I did a lot of different styles. Yeah. And one thing that I find uh, enjoyable about your book is you took this broad approach to Chinese martial arts history, whereas sometimes digging down into something can reveal a lot of treasures, but you miss the bigger picture. Mm. Uh, so I think I, that's one thing that I really enjoyed out of your book. Yeah, that was, I thought it was kind of the precursor. The, I mean, first of all, there was nothing really in English that I found that sort of gave a, an overview or that put it in Chinese history. And you know, at the end of the day, I'm still a historian, so I need to put it into that history and make it part of it. Uh, the other thing is I'm a pre-modernist, so my goal is really to see how far back I could trace something, but that splits me off because most of the way we experience martial arts right now is a very late imperial, uh, yes. so they, at best, the last three, four hundred years. Right. And uh, my period is usually the 10th and 11th century, so th it's very late for me. <laughs> and um, most of what we now understand uh, is, is coming out of the much later period. So 
Mm. I didn't want to work on that because it was later and that wasn't when I worked. Mm. And I wanted to, so some, one of the, and I think it was some of a justified complaint about the book was there's more detail, there's more stuff going on for what we want to know in recent times. And so someone said I should have sort of compressed everything up to say the Ming dynasty into you know a chapter or so and then spent much more time on Ming and Qing and modern which was partially a, it's a valid criticism on one level but on the other my goal was to try to show that it existed and had a history a longer yeah. history before right. that well and some of the stuff that I want to ask you about today is it's particularly important because it does go back further than the Ming dynasty, and we can trace uh, the breadcrumbs, if you will, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, the, the breadcrumbs get fewer and fewer as you go I back. No. It's um, so uh, speaking of the breadcrumbs, one of the topics I wanted to talk to you about today is. In Chinese martial arts, we have forms, uh, and please feel free to correct my Chinese. Is it Dao Lu that they're called? Tao yeah. Lu, uh, yeah. Um, I wasn't sure if it's Dao or Tao. I think I'm pretty sure it's. I think it's Tao Lu. Tao Lu. So yeah. Tao Lu Kata in Japanese, uh, the yeah. choreographed sets and sequences, and there's a ton of them now, um, yeah. but. In your book, I noticed that they go back quite a ways. Did you, can you elaborate on that and well, it, talk it, about when they started, why, and the evolution of that? Well, as far as, so, so you mentioned this to me when, when you know, you, you'd emailed before, and I happened to actually be reading uh, uh, Ma Minga's, uh, what is it, uh, Wu Shui, which is his, he's this great you know, major figure in, in the Chinese martial arts community, and he's published a lot of research. He's also a martial artist, family, long family tradition, mm. and, and a Chinese traditional doctor. Oh, so okay. He, he's like exactly that thing that you were thinking of, you know, like this guy who's like a doctor, a Chinese doctor, and a martial artist and comes from a family of that. And he's also, right. um, I think he's Hui, so he's not Han Chinese. Okay. And his, I think it was his grandfather was involved in some of the compilation of these martial arts in the early 20th century. Okay. And he actually had a comment about Tao Lu, which was that, you know, this was modern. Mm -hmm. that, and that he actually complains in this book that the institutional creation of these martial arts ended up being way too rigid. Yes. And too systematized. Yeah. So a lot of what we're looking at now is probably 20th century. Mm -hmm. And as for, you know, evidence of forms, that's hard to, you know, I mean, we all know as martial arts, we have that difference between the sort of, uh, what in Taekwondo, they used to have the one step sparring, you know, you, uh, right, you throw right. punch, boom, you know, and then you had like, I think there was something like 27 of them, if I recall my, you know, it's been a long time since I did Taekwondo. I can't remember either. But, you know, we had like, you know, we had basic form and we had, you know, eight, in my school, they had eight Palge and eight Teguk. And then we had like 27 one-step sparrings. And then we had all, you know, and then you had, and, and to the extent that the forms are a combination of one-step sparrings, more or less, you know, you have to ask yourself, what were they doing anything like what we would see as forms now. Well, I thought you mentioned early in one of the early dynasties that they were using them as a uh, troop calisthenics and a way of intimidating the opponents on the battlefield as like a martial dance. Is that? Um, so then we have, so then, you get, so there are, I think the earliest things that we'd sort of associate with that. And, and again, this is back to what do you actually have recorded? Mm. There were recreations, uh, there were sort of a abstract recreations of battles that had happened in the past, that okay. they were form at court with weapons. But so they, they would, at court, as part of the ordinary ceremonies, they would perform a recreation of the decisive battle that had, you know, gotten them into power. This was the, I think it was Joe Dynasty did this. Uh, and then you have 
mass training, you know, everyone stand in a line, hold a spear, you know, that sort of stuff. And then you, as you progress, you get to these questions. Uh, I know in the Sung, they have a, there is a manual we have that says, okay, at the sound of the first drum, these troops do this. Then you sound the drum again, and they do this other thing. They stand up, they sit down, they you know point the spears, uh, they open up their formation. The like drum rises. ceremony, what we, what yeah. we did in the army, yeah. Yeah. Well, and this becomes training for actual... I mean, when you think about modern... Modern warfare is very different in the sense that you don't develop firepower in the same way or mm -hmm. fighting power would more appropriately. In pre-modern times before gunpowder weapons, you developed fighting power of a group by getting as many guys on the field as you could. Right. Once you start getting chemically powered weapons and all kinds of other things, suddenly having all those guys on the field isn't such a good idea. In one spot, yeah. In one spot. You know, so and then you're actually trying to train everyone, okay, don't bunch up, you know, spread out. Uh, but in, in, mm -hmm. in pre-modern combat, you have to say, okay, everyone, stand there with your spear out, and then in this formation, when the other guy comes charging at you, realize that if you all stay together, you're safer than right. if you run away, or even if you personally go out and try to kill someone. Right. Like the Spartans. Yeah. As well. And, and a lot of other military yeah. I mean, strategies. Mass and training veteran troops who know that, you know, we're relatively safe if we stay together. But that, that takes a lot of training. Well... And this, this wasn't a question that I, I had written down because this, this all just uh, came to me while you were telling me this. The, there's an aspect of military training, even though today the purposes in the U.S. military wouldn't find any value in that type of uh, training for combat, it's still heavily used for drill and ceremony going back to even George Washington trying to whip civilians into shape to be able to fight and be a coordinated army. Now, is there any evidence that the, the Chinese would have used that in that regard as well? Or is it? I... Yeah, I don't know if they broke it down. I mean, I think, you know, we, we're used to these pedagogical methods where we break everything down into their finer forms and you know this aspect of teaching does this and that aspect of teaching oh does yeah this. okay <clears throat> that would have been the way they would have you mm. know they, i think they understood that well, okay you're going to run a war if you're going to run the army this is what you do and did yeah. they get down into well this part causes unit cohesion and this part causes i don't see that um you know, personally, I also don't agree with that too much from an educational point of view because that's what has done so much damage to a lot of education on, on one level. I, I, there's a lot of value to it, but when you start breaking down and examining your teaching methods on some, you say, well, wh why did we do it this way? Yeah. And I believe it on one level, but on the other level, as you begin to try to articulate it, you find out that there's a lot of stuff going on that you can't articulate. And hmm. you... you, you I mean, think about the charisma of the instructor. I mean, you run a school. Absolutely. And it's huge. It's huge. And yet we don't really talk about that in terms of, well, why did you go to that school? Well, I stuck with that school because I like that teacher. Or yeah, um, I could learn from that teacher because they're, you know, because when you go to get coached, you need to have someone who you'll listen to. Right. Now, what caused you to choose to cover the entire breadth of breadth of Chinese martial arts versus versus focusing on just say the Song dynasty or the Han dynasty. Well, I, you know, I, I take the uh, the bold position that on one level I was trying to create a field. Or oh, well, that's yeah, um, that's and valid. I was faced. I've been in academia long enough to have some sort of self-awareness about how fields work and how they don't work. And to be honest, I don't think we really have a field yet. We, have, we can have publication. And fields lag publication, oddly. Um, partly that's because to have a field, you have to have people hired. Uh, 
And there's really almost no one who you could say they were hired to teach martial arts history or, or they were, we hired a Chinese historian and they're, they're doing this cool research on Chinese martial arts history. You don't, I don't think there's anyone like that. So you know? you're, you chose to focus to try to, on this broader perspective, to try to develop a field rather yeah. than get yeah. narrowed down. Well, okay. let's say if I had produced a book on martial arts during the, during the Song Dynasty, yeah, assuming I could have even gotten it published, and that's a big question mark, um, who is going to read that? Who is yeah. going to pretty much? Whereas, and I should say, when I proposed the martial arts history that I did write, the Chinese martial arts history, they couldn't find, so Cambridge requires three anonymous readers to evaluate the, the proposal. Huh. And they couldn't find three. Wow. So they found two. Um, and again, this, this, it's academia. So what you're looking for is you need a person, ideally a senior person from a great university. And you know, this, it's, this is, it's a feudal system, right? It's all about status. And you want, Ideally, you want, you know, three guys from the top universities to evaluate that and say, yes, this will be useful. This book will be good. And then they approve it. Well, they looked at it. So there's no, there were no senior people about There's no one in academia who had written anything. So then they're trying to get about, people. Sorry, go ahead. I uh, was going to say, what about Douglas Weil? Because he had written a lot of Tai Chi stuff. The translation. Uh, you know, he was translating. And he was in literature. Oh, okay. Now, I don't know. Now, to be honest with you, they found two people. They eventually, I'm trying to remember how we found a third. It was, you know, because I'm not supposed to know who anybody is. Right. One person who they got objected because, you know, the whole point of the book was that there's a history. It's not just this. I, our, it's not just our modern concept of martial arts. Right. And the right. person was really offended by that. Wow. And they were like, no, but what about the art? And, yeah. and so you also, so there's also, a, there's huge sociological issues that come into this where you have someone reading it who, let's say, they have a very specific notion about what martial arts is. And I presume if, that person had an idea of it as this enlightened thing and it was about nonviolence and it wasn't about war. And then I, they're reading this thing where I'm saying the whole point of the stuff is, it, you know, is, is military practice. Right. Right. And, no, I like that very much. Cause I like how each chapter you break down, well, this is what they were doing with archery and this is what they were doing with hand to hand combat. And this is what they were doing with chariots. And, yeah. uh, uh, but if that's not what you expect, that's not what you want. Well, people have a perception or yeah. a preconceived notion or what their belief structure is that they were brought up in, in the martial arts and yeah. they, they stick to, it. I deal with it day in and day out. I mean, I run a YouTube channel on uh, creating application videos for Mantis boxing and people yeah. that have been doing Mantis boxing longer than I've been alive or just, that's not Mantis. That's, uh, you know, they, they are just, yeah ingrained that this is what it is and that's all it is and there's no open-mindedness but that's a broader sociological issue anyway i would think yeah but so so there literally was they couldn't get three people who were even or they we just barely got three people who could even vaguely be said to have some qualification to yeah. examine the proposal so then once you do that once there is a book then you can do, you know, the narrower focused things. Okay. Because when someone says, well, you know, no one, there's no field in it. Now, of course, I also want to point out to you, it wasn't that there weren't Chinese books that covered this stuff. Okay. There was just nothing in English. So, and I said in my proposal, you know, there's this Chinese book and that Chinese, these are respectable martial arts scholars, you know, uh, uh, Lin Boyuan and people like that. And, and, but, right. That doesn't exist in the English language world, so that doesn't exist in, in Anglo-American or Western the academy. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So having done that, now it becomes possible to say, 
There is something. It came out of Cambridge University Press, so that's a respectable press. It's, uh, you know, to the extent that I'm a standard academic, you know, okay, so it's, it's a legitimate historical study. It's, it's not making, you know, crazy claims. Now you can start doing more detailed things. So that was kind of my hope. And then what happened was very soon after that came out, and I had no awareness of much of, you know, there was Stan Henning, who I'd been in touch with, yeah. and, and Stan did, and I, still, I haven't been able to get back in touch with him. I, I lost his, his email address went down. I, but he taught me a lot. I got a lot out of his stuff. He was doing this great stuff. You know, Douglas Weil had done, you know, some translations and... And then suddenly, uh, Paul Bowman and all of this martial arts study stuff yeah. shows on my radar. Like I said, you know, I, I think we were all kind of operating independently of each other. Yeah. And, you know, and then you turn around, whoa, there's all these people. Well, that's great. So, well, that's, I mean, I found your book and then I found the martial arts studies and then I found the papers and it just yeah. it opened up. It's like, oh, this is, all this stuff is here now that wasn't here 10 years ago. Yeah. And, and so that's just, so it's just fantastic. Yeah, it is. It's really helpful for, for unlocking the, the history or the truth or weeding through the, the mysticism or the esoteric nonsense. And yeah, well, so a more specific question I had for you today uh, is something that does come up with Mantis Boxing as well. In your book, you mentioned repeatedly uh, the 18 martial arts styles or... It's, it's, the 18, it's like the 18 weapons. It's sort of like, it's this weird term because I think I showed that it changes, like what? Yes, well, that's what I was gonna ask you about is, so this changes as, you, and you make a note of it in a few different dynasties. Well, yeah. now this is redefined as this. Yeah. and. What struck me with that, I mean, I was going to ask if you could elaborate on that and define them. And then also what's, what stands out as I read it is Mantis has a, an oral history mm -hmm. and there's, there's a lot that is to be desired with some of it. But one thing that is consistently brought up in the different lines is it was a hybrid of 18 different martial arts. Oh, yeah. Which is is silly, but then when I saw your book and I saw that, well, uh, most of those eighteen are weapons, and yeah. Mantis has a ton of weapons uh, uh, forms that came down with those traditions. So, it it uh, could you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, I think it was. I'm trying to remember now. I haven't. You know, that that's the uh, the other aspect of writing books is that. Uh, yeah, I know you write yeah, something uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can find one here. Um, I got it. Oh, okay. okay. The 18 martial arts in the Ming. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that it changed in the Ming by one account. It was bow, crossbow, spear, sword, long sword, mouth spear, shield, fu axe, yu axe, g halberd, whip, metal tablet, truncheon, shoe spear, fork, claw head, silk corded lasso, and then unarmed striking is last. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I think it, it, it just becomes this shorthand for, you know, it's kind of like our, we have this ideal that we can go in any weapon, you know, not just that you know, I mean, most of us would be like, oh, it's a knife. Uh, <laughs> that, that is a screwdriver, that is a knife, that's a wrench. Right. You know, but but um, that somehow you'd be a master of combat and that any any weapon you'd be, yeah. you'd master. And that's, that's a, it's an interesting concept because what does mastery really mean? And I just did a podcast on that last week. <laughs> yeah. But we're all, we're all, you know, uh, troubled by that as a, as an issue because, you know, you can be really good at one thing and win every single fight and not actually be good at any of the other things that might have been possible. I mean, we see this in the UFC all the time, right? I, I, yeah, I, I always wonder, looking at the UFC, why there isn't much more emphasis on um, leg techniques. 
because it always seems like you, someone gets knocked down, the other guy's coming in, and why he doesn't just go up into for a heel hook or something, you know. I know. I know. And, and it just seems like the obvious thing to do because he's standing right there, your legs are inside his legs, you know, because he's coming in because he's thinking he wants to go into mount. Well, I mean, as a an insight that, and this might not be the answer, but from what I've seen, like in the jiu-jitsu schools that I train in, if they're following the IBJJF rules, yeah. you're not even allowed to do an ankle lock until blue belt. Yeah. So, and then you're not allowed to do heel hooks until you're black belt. So, and this is one of my, this is a personal pet peeve I have with that modality or that method is that from my own perspective, I used to tell black belts that I would roll with, please do ankle locks on me. Please do knee bars, even though they weren't supposed to, because I don't want to wait, you know, five, six years before I ever know what it feels like to get caught in an ankle lock or a knee bar or defend against that. And if these guys that did do jujitsu training in any school that follows that rule set, then they would be limited on any of those attacks until later on. Yeah. I mean, I, and I, I, I'm fortunate in my school. I mean, you have some very good students uh, that I got to roll with. That was a lot of fun. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Thank you. That's awesome. We have the school I'm in now, you know, I came in before all this crisis started and I was on the mat at one point. We had seven black belts on the mat. Wow. We had, you know, we, me and a couple of the other brown belts, the two of the other, and we were like cowering saying, you know, we're like the only, because it was like, they had just thrown a bunch of people. So there's all these black belts and then suddenly there was all these purple belts and we were like, we're like, you know, there's not a lot of brown belts around. And, right. <laughs> but, but for a number of reasons, the culture shifted at a certain point and people started doing those techniques more. Suddenly everyone's doing those techniques. Mm. So you're not, the availability of people you're going to have to fight who are going to be trying that suddenly just increased. Not because someone made a, dis- a conscious decision, but because a bunch of people, somebody started doing it. And then, a yeah. Bunch of, yeah. And I mean, and- if you, if you talk to the guy that they, they credited with spider guard, he tells you, no, I didn't invent it. Yeah. There were three people that came up with the same idea around the same time from different schools. Yeah. And it just, it stuck. It became a thing. Yeah. And so the good thing is because the school, I mean, there's a lot of people who compete so, you know, you, you know, I'm not saying there's not some school where we win every time, you know, we're one of these giant schools, but you know, you get a guy and he comes like, Oh, well, he just won gold in the worlds in you know, his thing. So, you know, when you're rolling with this guy that he's, you know, he's trying to be up to the international standard, you know, he's, he's, he's looking for, so I'm a free rider. I get to roll with these people who are really serious. Yeah. You know, you and, and not, yeah, but but I to tell you, I'm honestly actually worried. I, I have hit lead techniques on you know blue belts or higher belts than that that I had to let go because mm. I don't want to find out that they don't understand how dangerous the situation is. Uh, yeah. And that, that's the concern. I, look, I, I had, there was someone I was rolling with at one point. They didn't, they didn't understand the, uh, the arm bar they were in. They were lower belt. And, and, but because I think when I was a lower belt, I would have been much more, I would have wanted them much more. I, wanted, I would have wanted that tap much more than I wanted their safety. Mm. Uh, and when you get higher, you go, their safety is more important yeah. than, yeah. But that's an ego issue, not a, you know, so it's like, it is. So you know, and, you know, you got some guy who's going to come out and say, oh, man, I, I rolled with a belt and he didn't hit anything on me. And, you know, someone who's watching might be like, no, dude, he, you know, he was letting you do stuff. He was, you know, he, he, he had a position. He let, yeah. but. Um, All right. Well, so back to what you were saying about the weapons. So about specializing yeah. versus or. Uh, if you know how to use a, I think the point you were trying to make is you, if you know how to use a pole arm, then yeah. a staff and a spear are going to be very similar to each other. Oh gosh, that's a huge argument. And okay. uh, <laughs> whether staff and spear are the same, there's a huge <laughs> main dynasty fight about 
that. And, you know, one, there's one argument that says they're the same and the other says, no, 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 they're completely different, you know. Um, well, my next question was, can you explain to everyone the significance of uh, who General Chi Ji Guang was and okay. why uh, or the significance he plays in the history of Chinese martial arts? Okay. And, and I'm uh, happy to do that one. I also happy to push. I just read a wonderful dissertation by uh, Israel Kanner on okay. Chi Ji Guang's unarmed combat section, the Chuan Jing, the Fist Classic, which yep. comes out in the 1560 edition. And I mentioned, you said you saw the martial arts studies reader. Um, and there's a whole issue that I bring up. Oh, maybe it's not there. I did an article on Chi Ji Guang's martial arts. Um, in a volume on uh, Chi Ji Guang, mm -hmm. and he removes that chapter in yes. a new edition. And what uh, Israel Kanner argues is that even he removed that, it went out of the military training in that sense, mm -hmm. but it became the beginning of a discourse of a literature that discussed unarmed fighting. Interesting. So, sixty or. 50, yeah, the 1560 uh, Chuanjing, that chapter. And that becomes, starts its own intellectual tradition of discussion of unarmed combat. Okay. Uh, it, it's, so there's a lot more complicated history here about that. But Chi Ji Guang is our first military manual that has actual techniques in it. So uh, I'm translating very slowly. Uh, 10th century manual on wrestling, but yes, it doesn't make sense. Which, and I've seen the drawings from his uh, book, and yeah. a lot of those are uh, moves that exist in current or modern uh, Chinese boxing systems, one being uh, Tai Chi or Tai Chi yeah. Twin uh, in particular. A lot of those moves carried over. Yeah. Um, but in your book, you mention that his survey, he did a survey of the local martial arts in Yantai, and he complains, I found this amusing because um, <laughs> it, uh, it carried forward hundreds of years later to the modern day. The still argument is he's complaining about flowery boxing yeah. styles that don't have any substance. They don't work. They're just uh, dance. Well, he also complains the difference, and, and I don't. I tried not to use the term style when I, I know it, because he says okay. well, this martial art, and they have part of it, and this martial art has part of it, and none of these things have. Nobody has the complete system, and um, <laughs> you know that that gets back to a little bit like this, this mythology that we get, or this notion that someone's going to tell you, look, study this martial art and tell everything. And, yeah. you know, that seems to be always a question. And that's what mixed martial arts brought up a very interesting challenge to what we would call sort of traditional martial arts in the sense that a lot of traditional martial arts, as, and I mentioned before, Ma Ming Da had complained, they got very rigid. And they said, this is what this art is, and if it's not this, if it's not in this curriculum, it's not that. It's something else. Which is funny because even when I started in my first uh, Kung Fu school, even though it's not a good term, um, the, the manual that we got, this was in the 90s, so you got your paper photocopied manual, yeah. was the, the basically the four pillars of Chinese martial arts, the yeah. striking, the kicking, the locking, the throwing. Yeah. Like, well, that's mixed martial arts. That's, yeah. Uh, so it, the concept, I mean, would you, would you say that Xi Ji Guang was maybe the grandfather of MMA in China? <laughs> you know, I, I, my assumption is that when, you know, so one of the reasons why it's useful to separate military from non-military martial arts, if, if there is that, is that the military guys have a very narrow set of possibilities and needs. Yeah. You know, they don't need you to be able to fight with six different weapons. They need no. you to fight with one or maybe two. Um, they need you to fight in, let's say, armor. 
they don't need you to, you know, and they're, they're, they're not, you know, as they say in the modern uh, military, you know, if you're engaged in hand-to-hand combat, you did something wrong, you know. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Something's really, right. if, you know, let alone, I mean, if you're fighting with a knife, you've done something wrong. If you're fighting, if you're unarmed combat in a real opponent, something, you yeah. know, is, is really, something really went sideways uh, to not use profanity. Um, and... We had, uh, we call it foobar when I was in yeah. the army. <laughs> progression from what is it? You know, snafu was it snafu foobar? Yeah, tarfu? snafu. I think snafu was first. First, and then it was I can't remember. Then tarfu foobar or the other way around. But yeah. Um, but but you know, so if you're actually doing that, something went wrong. And then the issue with Chi Chi Guang is what was the you know he he makes this argument that the function of hand-to-hand combat is not, it's not useful in, war, in, in a war. He actually yeah. says that. And, but he says it's about you know, training you to move your hands and feet, and it's, it's and, and, you know, so we're always faced with that question. What exactly is the function of some of this stuff? Whereas we in the modern world, even in America, we can say, even in Tennessee, um, Unarmed combat, if you're going to end up in a fight, is probably far more likely than armed combat. Yes. Um, uh. And so from that sense, it's, it's very pragmatic. And then we get down to the, well, okay, do you know how to fight on the ground? Right. And uh, it was always clear to me when, from when I started martial arts that what happens on the ground? You know? Yeah. I used to uh, run self-defense workshops and... It, it was like the first question that anyone would ask. Yeah. What happens if we end up on the ground? Yeah. And, and yeah, you take someone who knows how to good stand up and they get on the ground and they're just, you know, you can't, you know, all that footwork goes away, all of the, and, and um, what's that one guy who does that show, uh, Hard to Hurt, and he talks about how, uh, was it, you know, you're not a ground fighter. And, uh, and he said, you know, self-defense is probably like, what is he? It's like jab, punch, and sprawl. You know, and you don't want to be on the ground. Um, that was Chuck Liddell's strategy. I mean, yeah. he was a wrestler, I think collegiate wrestler, yeah. but he never went to the ground if he could help it. Yeah. Um, well, but of course it was the threat. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, and so that's the, you're more willing to do certain things if you're not worried about falling into something where you, you know, got a problem. Uh, yeah. And I realized that uh, I was doing some MMA stuff when I was first doing jujitsu at the school because they have it. And I realized that if I did any stand up, I would not go to the ground. I wouldn't work on the jujitsu. Yeah. Because I had, you know, 25 years of striking of stand up and, and some throwing, but not, no ground fighting before that. So the only way to get me to really do the ground work the jujitsu was to not, is to remove that whole first part. Uh, now, maybe from a self-defense point of view, that's not good. Well, I, I would add as from a coaching perspective over the years, what I've noticed because I teach two modalities, I teach the Mantis boxing and I teach the Brazilian jujitsu. And even now I have students that do both. Yeah. They have this, there's a barrier in the brain and it, it's really the way there's a great um, book. I think the brain that changes itself. Uh, no, that's not the one. There's another one on um, how our brain functions and works. And if you don't connect the neurons for the stand up in the ground and work on that phase in between, it's like two different worlds in your brain. It's like, well, that's this over here. And I compartmentalize that because it makes me able to learn. But then when somebody puts me in this environment, I'm completely shut down. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, I was noticing because um, I was uh, practicing banjo and uh, that my, I will read like, per, you know, da, 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 da. and then the, I'll have a pause as my eyes then go down to the next, uh, uh, you know, staff, or, you know, the next level. And that's not in the music. There's not this pause. That, it doesn't break in those places. Or, you know, my brain sees the musical notation and breaks it at, because there's a line there, right? Right. And so I go, da-da-da, da-da-da. <laughs> and, and, and so how do you, you know, how do you get to that one, two, drop, do a double leg, you know, move into, 
that's a yeah. Really hard to do because each of those skills is so hard to do well, and then the transition is even harder. And so, when you just to see somebody do one, two, drop, double leg, move, you know, slide in across, go to mount, you know, take, and to do that, yeah, uh, and uh, yeah. it's a threat. I mean, you got to put it together, and it is hard because each of them are you could get. Very high level. I mean, if you look at uh, each of those components is a specialty in different martial arts. Yeah. Wrestling is a specialty. Boxing is a specialty. Kickboxing is a specialty or Taekwondo if you want to yeah. focus really heavily on the kicking. Um, judo, another one. And then you got the ground. So, yeah. And, and all, yeah. And, and, and so it, it's, you know, is anyone a master of all the, you could have someone who's, you know, so then we always have these comparisons in, in mixed martial arts of someone, they are good at this or good at that, or this person's the most complete. And that being complete is itself uh, a, almost like a separate skill. Yeah, I actually enjoyed the UFC more. I don't really watch it anymore. I actually enjoyed it more. And I started watching the women's division yeah. a few years ago because it was like watching the old UFC yeah. Where people came in with specialties. Yeah. So you pit the specialty versus the specialty, and it was far more interesting to watch than the vanilla. Yeah. Everybody's got a little striking, a little kicking, a little ground, a little wrestling, a little nutrition, a little, you know, <laughs> a yeah. little of everything. Where it's not as you don't find as many of the wow, oh look at that. Like remember Caro Parisian? Yeah. You would see him pull off a judo throw. In the middle of the cage match, you'd be like, "What? Yeah, what's that?" Um, it just didn't happen, but you, yeah, miss out on that. So, so Chi Ji Guang, not the grandfather of MMA. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I mean, because if you look at it, he's not doing any. Everything's standing. Yeah, that's true. Well, if you yes, if you include the ground as part of that, I could see that. Well, you know, as a you can't, you know, wait, you guys aren't on the ground, you know? Yeah. 